Mike, can you hear me? There we go. Okay, sorry. So if you just joined us, welcome to the evening broadcast of the Church Safety Guys. I am James, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Mike and Paul. I appreciate your patience. I've got new technology in front of me, so that's what I keep forgetting that it works separate from... <laughs> Like, can you can you guys hear me? I'm gonna start <laughs> start miming here. Is this thing on? <laughs> so anyhow, um, so welcome. We appreciate you guys. Uh, we appreciate you guys watching tonight. Uh, we have the honor of of playing a recording that we did with uh, Pastor Frank Pomeroy of the First Bath First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs. If I can. Uh, Sunderland Springs, sorry, if I can actually say it correctly. And uh, it was a really great interview. It was actually about an hour, I think it was about an hour, just over an hour long. So what we're going to try and do is for our, our uh, normal course of evening, we're going to try and cut it in half for you guys to see. And then we'll we'll do our normal break and then we'll come back and, and uh, kind of... <clears throat> kind of chat about it. Look at this. You guys are like ripping me apart in the comments. Dave is like always trying to play with something new. Well, you know, we're trying to make things better for, for you guys. And then Dan's like, you're the only person who ever had problems with technology. What? <laughs> he doesn't see. That's why I'm saying it's so important to start doing the the, the practice roles. We need to start recording those because, you know, Paul has had just as much problems with technology. <laughs> and I can tell you that the behind the scenes dance numbers that Paul puts on in the background are, are something to witness. So I didn't even watch it tonight. Cause I'm like, I, uh, yeah, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go down that road. I'm back here. <laughs> Boogie into the music. I think the only person that hasn't ever had technology issues is Mike, but I don't know why that is. Brought to you by Dell. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe no that's comment. the maybe that's the key. So, anyhow, if you're joining us, thanks for listening. Um, welcome, Carl. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get our our interview with Frank Pomeroy keyed up here in a few seconds. And um, really, I, you know, I think I, I speak for the three of us when we talked to him. Uh, it was really powerful, like his his commentary on what happened. And uh, it was interesting just hearing an inside story. And the reason I say inside story is because, honestly, um, you know, we I learned so much that the media didn't, you know, didn't portray. And of course, you know, I mean, we all know there's there's bits to every story, like both sides. But between him and then inter interviewing uh, Stephen Williford, it kind of to me, it kind of put a far better picture together of um, <clears throat> really seeing spiritual warfare and seeing how, you know, a lot of times with this this type of tragedy, people will say, well, you know, where was God in this situation? And when when I finished listening, uh, and I know you guys felt the same way, but when I finished listening to it, it wasn't where was God. It was that's where God was in orchestrating, you know, different things happening. And I think uh, I definitely think you guys will will find it interesting and enjoyable, and uh, and hopefully be blessed by that. So I am going to go ahead and pull that in, and uh, we'll get that rolling for you. All right. Well, we are recording live this evening with the Church Safety Guys, and we have a special guest with us. Uh, Pastor Frank Pomeroy from Sutherland Springs uh, was gracious enough to join us and uh, offer <laughs> offer to help us uh, answer some questions and, and whatnot. Um, but I guess for, for starters tonight, sir, if you uh, if you could... Um, kind of just outline, if you don't mind, some of the events that I know um, happened at your your church almost three years ago. Well, when you say outline the events, um, just kind of share with you where I w w the sure. Oh, 
Well, the um, I think everybody by now knows what, what transpired in Sutherland Springs in the uh, calamity that happened. I, ha I have to share that the uh, obviously I was not there that day. My wife and I both were out of town in the um, I was actually at a training up in Colorado, excuse me, Oklahoma at a training for uh, summer camp. I teach riflery at summer camp at the RA camp, Royal Ambassadors. And we went to incorporate black powder uh, things and in, lessons into the rifle range because there's a lot of spiritual applications that you can put to the having to pay attention to primitive riflery and such. Anyway, to get that certification, because it's a rare cert anymore, the only time that I could get it before July, which was summer camp, was that weekend in November up in Oklahoma. And my uh, chairman of the deacons uh, was, was one of the, uh, I guess you say, directors, co-directors of our A camp. So it was important to him that I would go. And he said, Frank, I really want you to go get this cert while I, uh, and I'll fill the pulpit for you this Sunday. So we, because rare, I mean, rarely do I ever miss a Sunday. Uh, again, God was the one who was the choreographer in all this. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I go through the first day of training, which is all the paperwork and all the boring stuff. And then comes the second day where you actually get to go to the range and things. And we meet together. And as we're meeting, going over the uh, safety instructions as we're going to get started down at the range, the, uh, I get a text from my videographer that there was an active shooter. Mm. And I texted back that that's not very funny. And he said, no, it's real. Mm. And at that point, <clears throat> I, I couldn't find, I couldn't get him anymore. There was no more. And I kind of quickly told the class, there's about eight of us, I think in this little class and uh, quickly tried to find a better signal. And obviously everyone I was texting nobody was answering because they were all within the, the walls of that church that I was thinking to text. Mm. I finally get a hold of my building and grounds guy who never misses, but we, we also ride in a motorcycle ministry. And for that motorcycle ministry, he was running an errand and was running a few minutes late to church. And he, I told him that the cryptic message that I got and he said, Frank, I'll be there in less than 10 minutes. And, um, then he called me back and, uh, and that's, uh, he, he called me back and said, Frank, it's bad. It's real bad. Mm. And, he, um, and he confirmed what had transpired in there. And I asked him about Annabelle and he's a Vietnam veteran. He's, he's a, you know, he's a rock solid guy. And he, he, he and I both being prior military, he knew I wanted a straight answer and he gave me the straight answer that she didn't make it. Um, and that's where uh, how everything began, if you will. Yeah. Hmm. Do, you, do you want me to continue with that story? Because it's a long. Sure. Uh, so when you at that point that you realized that you needed you obviously you needed to head back home and and um, how did you how did you respond at that point? You know, brother, I am. Uh, I remember being incredibly frustrated around Belden and in Dallas because of the construction and such. Mm -hmm. But the, um, at the time I, you know, I tell people now I look back, we're, we're two and a half years out from that. You know, mm -hmm. those first two weeks, I mean, I, people tell me a lot of things I said, a lot of things I did, things that, uh, you know, in, incredible things here, there and everywhere. But to be quite honest with you, I, I don't remember a whole lot in that right. drive. I really don't. I, I remember I had to tell my wife and she was in, she was working for FEMA and they had the hurricane in Florida. So she mm -hmm. was in Florida working for FEMA and I had to call her and tell her that there'd been a shooting cause it, I didn't want her to get it elsewhere. But then I wasn't even out of Oklahoma city yet when I heard on the radio that the pastor's wife was one, uh, excuse me, the pastor's daughter was one of the confirmed. And I thought, Oh my gosh, if it's already coming over the radio, I didn't want to tell my wife by phone. And I, um, 
so I had to call her and, you know, I didn't want her to be in an airport and see it on CNN or something. Um, so I had to tell her over the phone. Ouch. And then uh, I still praise God. Uh, he's retired now, but her supervisor heard her scream. And uh, I, I still thank God for him because he he went and and took her and, and uh, took her to the to the to the airport and told the airport what was going on and God just choreographed everything just right. Um, he went and got her stuff from her hotel and shipped it later. I mean, he just was a great, great guy that really helped in that. And she, um, mm -hmm. and I got to the airport in San Antonio the same time her airplane. I mean, it was perfect timing again. And they're not supposed to let you go down the breezeway anymore with a unless you have a boarding pass and told them who I was and what was going on. And they had already knew that she was on the plane and coming. Um, so they, they walked me right down there and I was able to meet her that, you know, down there cause she was not, um, you know, she just wasn't in a great position place. Of course. The, um, and, uh, I had two great friends uh, I, I i call them my aaron and er that the pastor from first baptist yorktown and the pastor from first baptist Carn city they were on site and i knew things were handled that night that this sunday evening and so my wife and i we went to my oldest son's house and all the kids all the kids the grandkids the family was there at his house and we all hunkered down that night at my old at my son's house uh, just kind of, you know, as a family, just trying to to comprehend what was being done, said. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, we drove to the church, and we our little country church had become a something that looked like off of uh, Criminal Minds or something. It was the FBI had their unit set up. They had a makeshift morgue set up in the on Fifth Street. They had Highway 539 completely closed down. They uh, they had all this presence of every kind of law enforcement, and um, when the state troopers saw, found out who it was, they walked me to the Texas Rangers, and the Texas <clears throat> Rangers took over. And uh, immediately, I I see all the the holes in the church and all the 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 aftermath, and and there was one person they couldn't identify, and. Sherry and I had to identify who this person was. And, and it's the unfortunate thing, even though it was just the next day, uh, Texas heat does bad stuff to a, to a person when they're left in a position all day because they can't move them until they identify them. So it's, um, it was, it was uh, not, we had to do things you did. Wouldn't expect to have to do stateside. Um, and then, uh, you know, but there was a ray of light. Uh, I always share with people for a while. I thought he was a an angel because they had the on Highway 87 and 539s where they set up all the the tape, and the news people had to stand outside of that. And that would that kept them a block away from us. Well, a man crossed the line, very tall, very dark. Uh, you know, a black gentleman, but very dark, completely exquisitely dressed, very tall, tall man. My my friend Mark, pastor of First Yorktown, is uh, six seven, and this man was taller than him, quite a bit taller than him. And the, he come walking, and he walked right by the sheriff. He walked by some of the state troopers, and I'm thinking, okay, well, somebody knows who he is or anything. And he comes to Sherry and I, my wife and I, and he wrapped those long arms around us. And I would like to tell you, brother, that I would have done this anyway, but I'm glad he looked at us. It, it, he looked me in the eye and he said, Frank, Satan took his best shot. But now you have to lift Christ. No matter what happens, you have to lift Christ. And and then he prayed with us. And that 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 was basically all he said. And then they said it's time to go with the officials and address the mm -hmm. the um, news media. Well, we go down there and we do that. And the um, and the, the officials do their thing. And then Sherry had written a little thing on her phone, and she read that and. We answered a few questions there and, uh, and I just shared with them. I didn't, uh, you know, somebody asked me what I was going to tell ev everybody 
for what basically the, the age old question, where's your God in the midst of this? And I say, I don't, I can't explain this, but my God does know what yeah. happened here. Hmm. And, uh, we walked away and I, I want to go back to this gentleman real quickly, just because later on I asked who he was. And nobody knew him. He crossed the line and made it all the way to us with nobody stopping him, hmm. but yet nobody knew him. And then we couldn't find him in pictures. And then I was really thinking, wow, maybe this was an angel of the Lord or something. And finally some pictures showed up and it turns out he is a, a street preacher from New York. And, and when he heard wow. about what <laughs> happened, he went, paid for an, a plane ticket, flew to San Antonio, drove to Sutherland Springs because God told him to tell me to lift up Christ. Spoke wow. to him maybe three minutes total, and he went back to New York. That, wow. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm still to this day flabbergasted by, um, by that. And, and I still to this day as well think about how he said you must lift up Christ. And though... He meant in the moment that's become, I mean, I, I've been a pastor for many years and I've always lifted Christ, but now I know no matter how severe or hard the trial may be, that's the first place I go. And I still mm -hmm. hear his voice resonating in my, in my psyche um, that day. Now I know, and, and I, in a way he is, you know, an angel means messenger. So he's still an angel in some <laughs> aspects, just maybe not the spiritual aspect. I was starting to think he was in the beginning. Um, but you know, at that point, I, uh, I have to be honest guys. And I've said this many times I looked after I, after I felt like the media kind of attacked my wife and I looked at the building and it's full of holes. I'm thinking about all the people who are gone, thinking about bell being gone. And I, Mark had been a great friend of mine for many years. In fact, he was my associate pastor for years before he went to be the pastor at First Baptist Yorktown. And, and I just looked at Mark. I, I never turned my back on God, but my spirituality was was um, was just very, very, very low. And I just mm -hmm. said, Mark, I, I I I don't have anything else to give. I'm done. I'm. And in my mind, I was. I was just. I was just finished. I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to. I didn't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. But I did. But I did know, and I think this is where uh, the counselor says that it's my military training, but I, com I was able to compartmentalize and just put on, I still had men in the midst of the field of battle, and they were in the hospitals, and I needed to go get them through it. And that's what I told Mark. I got to go, I got to go talk to the, the survivors. I got to go talk to those who uh, uh, made it through and, and shared Christ with them. And this is what really, you know, I'm not going to go into each story, but I'll share with you that when I, they were spread out over five different hospitals, Mark, at the time it was aggravating because I was thinking I'm a grown man. I drove down here, but, but Mark wouldn't let me drive. And I think back, I'm glad that he had the wherewithal to do that. But, um, he took me to these hospitals and, you know, two of one of them to those, to those who are conscious anyway, to every one of them, they they look and say something to the effect, "Thank you, Jesus, that I was persecuted in His namesake," and 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 they would say these powerful things that I, I felt a peace in that room when the shooter left out. I felt a calming and a peace, and felt the presence of God in this room. And I and I'm I'm just taking this in here. I went to encourage them, and they're saying these things to me. And then when I went to see Gunny, that's kind of the the, the change because Gunny is a, uh, is a, uh, you know, he was a big man. He was a strong man. He's retired gunnery sergeant from the Marines. And he, he, he was a, a big guy. And uh, just to let you know, one of the stories, they, he doesn't remember it, but they said after the shooting, he sat up on his pew. He was shot seven times in the abdomen. Mm -hmm. And he, they he held his hands up and just said, thank you, Jesus. But we have a nurse who was shot through the legs but she was also our children's uh, minister and worked with the children a lot. And she, she got up and was starting to apply tourniquets, but there were so many, this, our shooter had a propensity towards children. He didn't want any, hmm. you know, he, he just was, I won't go into detail, but he was really ugly with the children, just round after round, after round, after round. Um, hmm. And she would start to, 
to freak out. Even though she's an operating room nurse, she was, and, and Gunny couldn't move, but Gu Gunny hollered out, woman, you've been trained for a mission. Be about your mission. And mm -hmm. that was in his gunnery sergeant voice. And that snapped her back to reality. And mm -hmm. he said he did that three times. How many lives were saved by her tourniquets and, and limbs that were saved by her tourniquets that, because Gunny was able to do that? Well, Gunny, I go into BMC, Brooks Army Medical Center, and they, he's in a room. He's got so many machines hooked up to him. He's just, they don't expect him to make it, but he's, he's still fighting and he's cognitive. He can't speak or anything, but he can blink his eyes. I didn't know what to say. And I, I'll never forget it. Cause I just looked at him and said, Gunny, I know that God never gives up on you. And I don't remember a Marine ever giving up on anything. <laughs> and all of a sudden he sat up about a foot and a half. And though you couldn't hear, it, he went, Ooh, rah! and all <laughs> the machines went off in the room. <laughs> it was, it was uh, like, uh, I had to tell all the doctors, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but then we, um, but I share that story because, that was, that was 11 o'clock that night, Monday night. That was my last, you know, I'd been in hospitals all afternoon after leaving the church. Um, and I walked out of BMC and we're walking on the port parking lot. And it was one of those rare nights where, you know, San Antonio has got a lot of light pollution. However, for whatever the reason, I could see a lot of the stars and I had the grackle in the trees of the parking lot squawking back there. And, and, and I'm listening to those birds. And I'm looking at the stars. And, the, and and I know it sounds cliche, but it really was. I felt like God was just spoke to me. Where were you when I created the heavens and the universe? Trust me. Mm -hmm. And I just had a peace come over me. And I looked to Mark. And I said, I don't know how. Don't know where it's going to come from. I don't know what's the next step. But we have a remnant. And this remnant's going to grow. And God's going to use us. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And from that point on, um, and to this day, God is still blessing us in incredible ways. Even with COVID going on right now, we have a man, uh, Ian, in Manchester, England, that watches every midweek service, Sunday night, Sunday morning. We got uh, John in Poland, never misses a service. We have all these other people, too. I just Those two just ring a bell because they're, they're so faithful from these other countries. And yet God is using us to reach out to this. And I, I've learned that, that God's completely and fully and totally in control. And he is the overall choreographer. All right. If you just joined us, you are watching the Sunday night broadcast of the church safety guys. And, uh, we are actually playing a, a previous recorded uh, session with Frank Pomeroy, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs in Texas. They had, uh, well, actually this, I believe it's this November. Uh, it'll be three years since they had the, the worst church shooting uh, in U.S. history. And... Um, 26 people were fatally shot, and then uh, at least 20 others were wounded. And so um, we are not live uh, with Frank right now, but uh, we are open. And uh, as we play that, we're open for discussion. And we'd, we'd love if you guys have any questions or whatnot, feel free to post them. Feel free to share this, this podcast. Uh, we had the chance to actually interview and talk with him um, a couple, quite a few weeks ago, actually, and we recorded it. And we were trying to wait for the right, <laughs> the right time to um, to actually play it. And we actually we have to split the recording up this week and then next week because it's so long for our normal uh, for our normal broadcast. But uh, we're going to be going and taking a quick break, and uh, we'll watch some. Uh, spots from our our sponsors and then we'll jump back right back with you guys so uh, just hang out stay tuned with us My name is Jim Howard. I'm the executive director of Trinity Security Allies. I'm also the lead security person 
for Generations Christian Church here in Trinity, Florida. We run about a 35-man operation that we provide safety for the church through all the services and the different events that they have. This has been a really big thing for us to partner up with LaserShot and work with them in setting up church safety security scenarios. When we first got LaserShot back a year ago, the thing we liked about it the most was that it was teaching people who have concealed weapons permit and also law enforcement officers, putting them in scenarios that they would never be able to do at a shooting range, but putting them in a live scenario where they would have to make a split decision of whether to shoot or don't shoot. The scenarios that we shot today are based on real life situations. Domestic violence, where the husband comes in and attacks his ex-wife in the church. People trying to steal their children when they don't have custody of those children. These are the type of things that actual safety teams across the United States are going to run into. And of course, we do have the active shooters. And these are things that we have to pay attention to. There have been more and more active shooter situations going on in the United States right now. And so we have to be prepared. Whether it be overseas or in the United States, we have to be ready for what may face us in today's House of Worships. My name is Jim Howard. I'm an executive director of Trinity Security Allies, and I train with LaserShot. In the message translation of the Bible, Proverbs 15, verse 1 says, A gentle response diffuses anger. In my 20 years as a road patrol police officer, I have seen that work. A gentle response diffusing anger. I found a gentle response LLC in 2016 after observing that a vast majority of people who volunteer and work at churches do not have the background, training, or experience to properly handle a loud, rude, obnoxious person without inadvertently saying or doing something that actually escalates the situation. Gentle response is not just another lecture presentation. I have a team of current and former police officers with decades of experience, and we conduct very dynamic, realistic conflict de-escalation training seminars and scenarios, which are specifically designed to help a person develop stress inoculation, muscle memory, self-confidence, and confidence in other colleagues. You will not develop all that from just sitting through a lecture presentation or just watching a training video. My team and I travel around the country working with churches, businesses, corporations, state agencies, and law enforcement. We can help you and your personnel be much better prepared to effectively and successfully interact with a hostile, confrontational person and prevent a volatile situation from becoming a critical, violent incident. Contact me for more information or to lock in a training date at my webpage, gentle-response.com, or through your social media, your favorite social media platform, just do a search for Gentle Response. Okay, we are back from the break, and if you just joined us, we are the Church Safety Guys, and we're broadcasting uh, live, our Sunday night broadcast, and uh, tonight uh, it is a little bit different. Uh, this month, we are actually uh, going through our American Heroes series, and so uh, the next couple of weeks we'll be playing pre-recorded uh, episodes that aren't live, but we'll be live with you when we record when we play them. Uh, this week's service is actually, uh, or broadcast is actually broken down into two parts. So this week and next week, but. Uh, we are actually playing a recording from Frank Pomeroy, the, the pa pastor of the First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs in Texas, uh, the worst active shooter, uh, church-related shooting in U.S. history. And we had the chance a few, um, a few weeks ago, actually, to sit down with him. We couldn't do it on a Sunday night. We wanted to bring him live, but he's like, brother, I'd love to be on, but I've got to preach at my church. <laughs> and so... Um, so we, I said, well, could you do it, you know, a different night? Can we record it? And he's like, absolutely, whatever I can do to help you guys. So it was, it was a real blessing, but um, let me throw it while we're, while we're still in a break, I'll throw it to you guys and see if you have any thoughts right now of, of what we've watched so far. Whatever Satan intends for evil, God will turn to the good. 
I mean, amen. This this interview when we recorded this and it's had a, a chilling and powerful effect on me ever since. I've talked about it umpteen times with people in churches, my own church and friends, uh, saying, "Hey, you know, you've got to see this when it comes out." So that's the first thing that comes to mind is it's very powerful. It hit me even now replaying it uh, weeks later in the same way. I mean, how, how can you not? I mean, uh, we're all fathers here, at least the three of us. And how can you not hear that story of a father finding out about his own daughter and not feel it and how, or, or having to have that conversation with his wife over the phone? I mean, we're, we're well beyond just the ramifications of church safety in this interview and just the, the amazingness of what God did even through tragedy. And it chokes me up just talking about it, thinking about it. That we've only heard a little bit so far. And, and, and I hate to sound cliche and say there's so much more coming in this video, but it's true. But it's just unreal the amount of ways that God showed up even in that tragedy. I think honestly, you know, and and I think this is so true and so often with with pastors and believers that, you know, we think that those that have gone through tough times are um, strong, strong people, stronger than us, right? I mean, it's always well that person went through a suffering that was far greater than than mine has ever been, and yet you know we think of that individual as uh, okay, they must be a super super person and. You know, I loved Frank's candor and honesty and transparency that he he said, you know, look, I was at a low. I was at a time when, you know, I didn't know where my faith in God was going to go. And to me, um, just listening to that, uh, it is very emotional because I, I listen to it and I say, you know what? I mean, here's here's an individual that I lift up and I esteem as being, you know, a, a great man of God that. Uh, went through a horrible situation and yet, you know, he can sit there and say, you know, I'm going to lift Christ up and I'm going to do this. But he can also sit there and say, look, I'm going to be honest. I wasn't at a place where that's what I was thinking. I was really upset. Um, and I think that, I think that means a lot. Um, I think that just shows, again, uh, shows honesty and transparency that, um, that he's willing to offer that. So anyhow, let me pull that back in. Uh, we will actually go back to uh, watching uh, the interview that we did with Frank Pomeroy of First Baptist uh, Sutherland Springs, and uh, we'll let you enjoy some more of that this evening. And, mm -hmm. and we just have to let go and let God do what he needs to do and, and be quiet and just let it roll. Um, I, I have a couple questions for you. I, I've thought very prayerfully about this conversation and uh, I had, I, I'm going to tell you a painful conversation I had with somebody and that's why I posit these questions to you. I pose these questions to you. So I had a conversation with somebody that was rather, uh, rather braggadocious about their, uh, their uh, church safety team skills and informing me that they just wish somebody was dumb enough to come try. Thank you. And I was like, I said, first and foremost, we should never be wishing for something like that. I, we, we train for the day, but we pray it never comes. And I, I tried to explain to them. And, and if you could help, maybe if you're if you're able um, to paint a little bit of a picture, because God uses these things, whatever Satan intends for evil, God will turn to the good. Amen. But were there lawsuits or because obviously there were there was media fallout and scrutiny from the media and they were very invasive but were there lawsuits or people that fell away because of this alongside the good things that happened because i wish that man understood this isn't to walk in the in a rose garden well let me say this first of all paul the the first thing i would make sure to to let anyone understand again as i spoke earlier god's the choreographer and you can have the best laid plans there are Amen. But yet pride goeth before the fall. And I have a specific unfortunate testimony to exactly what you're saying, Paul. And I've shared this several times with Jimmy Meeks at his speaking events. Saturday evening, after we went through all our paperwork in the, you know, the boring part of the qualifications class. Anybody that's been through any kind of NRA qualifications <laughs> knows that first day is incredibly boring because they're going over everything that you 
already know if you're prob getting certified, probably, probably. <laughs> Let me throw probably out there. But anyway, um, but that evening we went to a golden corral, all of us to the, the instructors, all three instructors and the, and the cadet um, students. We all went in there and uh, we're talking and it came up about church security. Well, to be quite honest with you, though, I had kind of talked about it. We we're a country church in South Texas. Everybody's carrying. We mm -hmm. had that same arrogant, cocky attitude. In fact, we have there's been many a times I'd have a long rifle up at the pulpit as an illustration, a sermon illustration of some sort. Um, or one of the deacons may have it up there. You know, firearms around our church was not unheard of uh, in, in one aspect or another. Now, that being said, that day, that afternoon in Golden Corral, he, he's talking about that. And I told him, I said, well, that just can't happen in South Texas because we all are carrying firearms and we're out in the middle of nowhere. That We're out in the middle of the country. Everybody knows everybody. I'm not even remotely worried about that. I said those words the Saturday night before the shooting. Yeah. I mean, the night before the shooting. And to this day, I, wow. uh, again, I know it's God and God's choreographer, but I sure wish I'd never spoken those words. Um, not that I tempted him because he already had all this in the works, but, but I sure wish I'd never said those words. Um, but you know, the past is a past. I can't, I can't change the past, but I'm just speaking directly to the gentleman that said those words to you, I may not have been as, as vociferously braggadocious about it because I was a matter of fact mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Now, now that we have a for real security team and a thought out process, our little bubba fied good old boy idea we had back then was just, was ridiculous, you know, but yet we had that false sense of security bred by complacency and, and it's very sad where we were sitting at that moment. Now, I would also share the second part of your question is incredible to me how many people there are. I think somebody told me 66 lawsuits. However, they're not people from the church. Um, some of the people I, I can't even figure out how they're tied to people to have the lawsuits, to be quite honest with you. I, mm. I've stayed out of that. I don't want to be ingrained or involved in any of the of the that stuff because I don't want the church pulled into mm -hmm. into any of that stuff. And because uh, they said, well, you know, you lost your daughter, you could, uh, that, uh, you know, she wasn't the breadwinner. I don't have to take care of her health. Yes, I lost my daughter, but as the face of First Baptist Church, Sutherland Springs, I do not want that to go. You know where where that is going. So the, yes, there are lots of lawsuits and some of them are valid. You know, my worship leader, um, praise God, he's still there every Sunday. He's a godly young man. In fact, I'll tell you what he told me when I saw him in the hospital. It was three days before he came out of his coma because it, he was shot point blank in the back twice. The, uh, you know, on, he was laying under the pew and he put the, the long rifle right on his spine and shot. Hmm. But the, um, he, when I walked in, I'm trying to think, here's a 32 year old man. He was a race car driver, a tennis player, computer guy with a with a one and a half year old, almost two year old daughter. How am I going to tell him he's not ever going to walk again? You know, I, I'm trying to figure out. And, you know, I went into the room. His wife was on the bed beside him and they both looked at me and he smiled and he said, Frank, I'm kind of excited to see what the next phase of my life is that God has for me. That's the kind of spirit that wow. he has. Praise but God. that being said. He is going to have medical, major medical issues the rest of his life. Gunny, he lived, he survived. He was the longest one in the hospital. Um, but his plumbing, I mean, he, he is going to have major medical issues the rest of his life. Little Zoe, who was only eight, she's going to have, you know, she took uh, quite a few shots. I think it was six to the abdomen and, and, and buttocks area and that, had to rebuild her pelvis and you know, she's going to have stuff the whole rest of her life so that some of these folks, they need to have those opportunities to, to handle the medical things for the rest of their life. And then too, I would say the government is the one who they had six opportunities that he should have been put into the database and was not. 
-hmm. So I think if, even if there was no monetary basis whatsoever for those people, the fact to hold them accountable to make sure that, that, yeah, that, 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 right. That somebody in the bureaucracy, in as much bureaucracy as there is in the military, that should have not been missed that many times. Yeah. So, so there are lawsuits. There are, there's a lot of psychologically damaged people. Uh, even if he thinks that you're the man you were speaking of, even if he thinks he can take them out and they have a great security team, there is still psychological effects to everyone involved. That's long lasting. And then, uh, you know, to, um, even Stephen himself would tell you that though he was trained for the purpose he was, he, he carried out as a, as a instructor, he still, it still haunts in the back of his mind that he had to take a human life. Yeah. So, so when you, you know, I'm going to jump back to my military days. Usually the men who, you know, I hate to sound ugly, but I'm just going to put it out there. We always said the ones that run their mouth the most were the first ones headed back to the <laughs> metal. Yeah. <laughs> you <know>? Very true. <laughs> well, and see, that's, that is the, that is the thing with this is, you know, arrogance, pride goeth before a fall. And when, when people, like you said, I love the way that you said that we have a real safety team now. And I've had conversations with people that I have been terrified by the things they've told me that they considered proper safety. And, and I will tell you a quick positive story uh, of my own experience with what happened to you guys. When I studied it at length, um, we had a man in my church uh, who uh, was dying. It was a good friend of mine. He was part of my safety team was a Marine and um, he got done dirty. Camp Lejeune uh, took his life from the early eighties because of uh, fuel getting into the potable water. And at 55, we lost him. Well, end result, um, there's a young man in his life, his son, uh, severe uh, mental, emotional issues. And we had to take steps as his dad was dying. I had paperwork drawn up that would take my friend's firearms and secure them where the son couldn't get them because if there was ever a poster child for something that could go wrong, I would, I would say in my, based on my experience with him, it would have been him and I have to be careful because if I give too many details, somebody might be able to name the young man, but essentially the firearms were actually turned over to the sheriff's department and anybody that was to go after them would have to pay the court fees and then pass the background check to get them. And my concern was, and um, even people in his immediate circle raised the concern that he might've tried to come to our church uh, and shoot it up. He was mad at God before his dad died. Uh, and, or he might've just tried to go through the community and local law enforcement had dealt with him numerous times. And as a civilian police chaplain, I was asked multiple times to go deal with him. And it was situations like what you guys went through. And I know this is not, this is small comfort, but it was situations like what you guys went through that got me on the ball with this thing. And I mean, I was ringing people up and going, this is not going to happen. No, no, no. And I was in charge of my church's safety team. And so we got care. The firearms went over here. Things were put into place um, because I was like not on my watch. Amen. So, I mean, that's that may be some some small comfort. I have no idea. But that was a personal experience I had after that. Well, there, there's been many churches that Sutherland Springs opened their eyes to what needed to happen. And things have been averted. Even White Chapel. They said that one of the reasons why their security team was put in place was because they went to one of the sheepdog seminars that had been presented from when our shooting and because of what transpired in Sutherland Springs, they went to the sheepdog seminar to put their security team in place. And look how quickly that threat was neutralized. Sure, lives were lost, but at least it was rectified fairly quickly. Yeah. Interestingly, on the, the piece you mentioned there, Frank, is that the that whole side of things, the attitude towards not needing or the Texas, the Southern Texas, as a now Texan myself, um, I can recall conversations with my old team that when they heard the story about myself going to a church plant, they're like, why do you need a security team in Texas? That was the same sort of attitude and it carried across the country. So I felt that through that conversation. but. What a tremendous, what a tremendous uh, part of the story. I mean, I, I, I just see the, the faith kind of coming out of you as you speak. Um, it just, it, it takes me back. I choke up on it. Just, just even talking about it. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. God is, 
God is the only thing that got us through all of that. Mm -hmm. Like the, the first couple of weeks I've been told, well, you said this and you said that. That was so profound. That was true muscle memory of prayer and study because because I just don't remember. You know, the Sunday following, I, I preached that following Sunday because we said evil will not win. We will. Mm -hmm. They're not going to shut the doors of this church. Evil's not going to shut down God's word. And they said that was up there with Senator Cornyn and such. And, you know, I do to this day, I don't remember seeing him. <laughs> I was standing beside him <laughs> up on the stage. You know, that there's just God, uh, God just carried us through and still is carrying us through. I would say your the testimony is just, it's unbelievable. Um, you know, I, I think back and I remember when I heard, uh, heard what happened down, down there, I know I remember exactly where I was, exactly what I was doing. And, uh, you know, I was actually, I was at my church and someone actually came running up to me and said, you know, did you check the news? This church is under attack. And uh, honestly, we went into a, a lockdown state ourselves because we didn't know exactly what was going on and added additional, additional uh, precautions and whatnot until I could get to a, uh, TV to check out the news and see, you know, exactly what was going on. But, you know, I can, I can tell you that, uh, we've had, I had individuals shortly after come to me and, and thank me and say, you know, I, I appreciate all of the time that you've spent putting into a safety team or security team. And, uh, but yet, you know, we still have, even to this day and, and Paul, Paul nailed it really we still have individuals and churches that we talk to that are like, you know, I had a, we were, we were hosting a conference very much like um, the sheepdog conferences in Columbus. And I had I actually had a, a gentleman uh, message me and tell me that he wasn't going to come to that conference because he had one of the best trained teams in the state and he didn't really need to learn anything. He didn't need that information. And you know, I think collectively the three of us have been doing this now almost 40 or 50 years, like church safety in general. And, you know, we all feel like, you know, there's always something that you can learn. You, there's yeah. always some, some piece of, of every situation. And, um, you know, I will say that moving forward, watching, you know, watching you guys and, and seeing some of the, the media and I know the media gets crazy sometimes, but, um, you've definitely been an encouragement to me personally because of seeing how you guys handle it. And, you know, I've seen several of the conferences with Jimmy and, and, uh, where you spoke and that sort of thing. And I just, um, I appreciate it because to me, when I look at the situation, I don't know that I could have had the same attitude. I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that, you know, I, I could be something of an example, but at the same time, you know, every situation is different. I just don't know. But um, I definitely, I mean, I, I appreciate how you've taken a stand and, and how you su supported the community and, um, you know, well, you, you've been that example. Thank you, James. But I will say... Um, I've looked back since then and there has been many things in my life. I didn't understand from the, the had a horrible upbringing when I was a child, the military, you know, I look at all these things in my life and in my mind, I look back on that day in November, 2017. And I think for, as, as God told Esther for such a time as this, mm -hmm. I think all that all of a sudden made sense and made me into the person I needed to be. Mm. to lead through the moment that I was put there to lead in. So I can't take credit. I, I thank you for what you're saying, but really I'm just a summation of everything that God had, had choreographed to that point, just as you are the summation of whatever it may be that God's going to have you go. I pray you never have to go through anything, but whatever it, it may be, I think God, God just had me. I mean, bottom line, yes, I had to choose. I just thank God that that, Again, I'd like to think I did it, would have done it on my own. I still thank God for that New York street preacher coming down and reminding <laughs> me right before I got in front of those cameras, you have to lift Christ. Praise God. I know that. But I think there was a reason. 
Nothing happens without a reason. And I think God knew that I needed that last little nudge. All right. If you just joined us, you are watching the live broadcast of the Church Safety Guys. And uh, we are actually playing a pre recorded uh, message this evening uh, from Frank Pomeroy. He is the uh, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs. And uh, a very, very moving testimony of how uh, he and his church. Um, really just addressed the active shooter situation that they had uh, about almost three years ago. It'll actually be three years ago in, uh, I think, November, where they had 26 uh, fatally shot and 20, uh, 20 plus wounded. So, uh, you know, to me, again, we, we talked about, we kind of took a break earlier, but we kind of talked about uh, Frank's transparency and just the fact that uh, he was so honest and open uh, with us. And we'd love to play more of this. We're actually gonna gonna pick up next week uh, because we're kind of running short on time uh, tonight. The, the entire interview went about just over an hour long. So we had to cut it, kind of cut it up in sections and, and we decided to do a um, American Heroes Month where we broadcast just different people that we've had the opportunity to, to talk to and and uh, kind of uh, handle that from that standpoint. So what are your what are your guys closing thoughts on it? Mike, if you've got yours gathered, I'm still working on mine. So <laughs> go first. Sure. I, I, and I may repeat myself in this recording next week uh, with some of my <laughs> thoughts here. But um, in, in trying not to, I think that some of the things I picked out of it is uh, I'm still floored. Um, Every bit of this interview is probably the the, the best uh, interview I think I've ever been uh, privileged to be part of, um, and it's it's just because of how God moved. And I think uh, Frank talks about it so many times as God being the choreographer, and it's really made me want to think about all right, what has God choreographed in my life to lead up to where I'm at now? And I know. Our friend Simon talks with a lot of folks about uh, who, who I became and, and those things that helped choreograph in their lives to where they are now. And, and so it's, it's a really good thought is God has been doing things in people's lives, even when they don't know it. And then they show up when, when God put them in that situation. So I think there's just so much that's there, the, the, the faith that Frank exudes, the the calm confidence despite the tragedy and, and everything that was there, but God showing up, not just in Frank and not just in his faith, but through the other people that Frank spoke of, um, I think is just amazing. I, uh, getting, getting out there to that third layer of protection. Um, they, they, let's just say that they look like Fort Knox compared to what they looked like then from talking to Frank. And we'll hear more about that in next week's broadcast, but that extra set of eyes out there in the parking lot, even if they were ducking behind a vehicle and calling 911, uh, is incredibly valuable. And in moments like these seconds literally save lives. And, uh, later we're going to hear Stephen Williford's conversation and about, about what was happening at what point point as he was going in to, to, to take on and take out the shooter. And uh, this is where, I mean, we're talking about worst case scenario, the 1% that could ever happen. This is the perfect storm of bad things going on at your church that God willing, we will never face. But as was mentioned earlier, you, you train for that day and you pray it never happens. Um, I might, I might know how to fight off a dog in a dog attack, but I really don't want to be torn up by a dog. But having that set of eyes in the parking lot is crucial. Having radio communication back into your building, they could have been evacuating the building while the guy was still. And again, this is no recrimination against the Sutherland Springs Church. Please don't misunderstand sure. me. I'm not playing armchair quarterback. Frank would have been the first one to say, I just wish I could go back. And I wish that we could have had eyes in the parking lot and we could have been evacuating everybody out the back of the building and, and trying to catch this guy in an ambush while law enforcement was on the way. 
And then I'm not going to spoil it, but when they start talking about improvised medical, it'll blow your mind. And we need to be very seriously, we need to be thinking about medical the way we think about having fire, um, uh, uh, yes, extinguishers. And uh, sure. apparently very hard to say that word. But, it, <laughs> uh, but we need to be thinking about medical and medical training the way that we think about uh, fire extinguishers and, and how you just look over and go, oh, there's a fire extinguisher. So that, yeah. that's it for me. I think I'm just going to throw in real quick the, the training aspect of it. And I think you hit on a, a goal, as, as we say, a gold nugget that I want to come back to, you know, so often we do training and we encourage training, but the reality is until you actually have the practical application of doing that, a lot of times the training is, is really, I mean, you can do scenarios and you can do reenactments and stuff, but until you're actually in that moment, uh, it's very challenging to know how you're going to respond. And so we train for the worst and we assume, okay, you know, muscle memory will kick in and, and we'll do things, maybe things that we won't even remember. You know, there are certain situations that we've dealt, you know, at my church with high, high stress, high anxiety that I don't, you know, people come up to me even today and this, they'll slap me on the back and say, you did a fantastic job. And a part of that, I don't remember because I just, I was so focused and my adrenaline was running and that sort of thing. But, you know, the thing that pops into my mind is, is one thing, you know, John Riley says, John Riley uh, with Gentle Response, he's, their, their ministry is one of the sponsors of, of the church safety guys. And, you know, he, he says, and he says repeatedly, you know, you can, you can watch a video on de-escalation, but until you're actually in training in a scenario, hands-on talking to someone, you don't really have a complete understanding of how that works and the dynamics of it. And he's, I mean, I think he's spot on because, you know, again, going back to that training piece of it, um, it's like, you know, I can sit there and I can read a book and I can watch a video and I can do all these things, but until I have a realistic scenario in front of me with somebody screaming at me, you know, <laughs> and that sort of thing, um, that added real life dynamic, it's going to be very hard for me to get a complete grasp of how something like that would happen. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that uh, next week when we come back, we'll hear some of the, the wrap up session of that. But, you know, I think, honestly, I wish that we could simultaneously play <laughs> his broadcast with, uh, with Stevens because, you know, Stevens is just, it's so interesting seeing what was going on while Frank was out of town, you know, trying to, to get to his wife and, and, you know, talk to her and then get back down there. Uh, Steven has, obviously he was boots on the ground right there dealing with what's, uh, what's going to happen. So, or what was happening. So it was, it's pretty phenomenal listening to that. So <clears throat> Paul, did you want to say, yeah, I want to chase that because you made a good point there. Um, when you've trained with sim munitions, and I know you have, and I'm pretty sure, Mike, you've been around them as well, blanks and things like this. I say sim munitions, blanks. Um, I was in a training environment, and let's just say there were multiple law enforcement there, and the department head that was running the training decided to throw a curveball and had not told anybody there would be sim munitions. Now, he had cleared all of the live rounds, all of the live weapons. Nobody had a live weapon. Um, and he had made sure of that, but he actually threw a curveball. And when he did, he came around the corner shooting uh, 357 Magnum blanks. And Emily Davis made a comment about how how differently inside of a building. And I'm going to do a video one of these days, actually, with blanks being fired in, inside of various rooms and hallways, because that sound will sound like a trash can lid being banged or wooden blocks being clacked or a door slamming in our brain with our normalcy bias can dismiss it. And we actually had a gentleman that was in charge of maintenance for that facility walked around the corner, down a flight of stairs and around the corner into the simulation. Oh, that's right. You guys are doing that today. I wondered if there were some kids down here slamming doors and he had heard bang, bang, bang. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of those things we've got to remember is when you go back to, and you read uh, Carl Chin's book about the shooting at the Colorado Springs church, there were people walking out into the parking lot or turning around going, what was that? And actually walking out into the field of view of the shooter 
And this is where, as safety teams, I think I think we need a video out there. So somebody that's watching this that's got the skill sets to make a video <laughs> like this needs to make a video about blanks being fired inside of buildings so that people can go, wait, I've heard this before. And to wrap that up, I actually saw people freeze during those simulations because they weren't expecting the blanks. And they were like, wait, was that a real gun? <laughs> yep. All right. Well, you know, it's our time's up for the for the week. So as always, we appreciate you you joining us. Uh, check out check out our website, uh, churchsafetyguys.com for for more information or information to to get to previous broadcasts. Uh, as always, we put our broadcasts on YouTube uh, the day after. So if you need to follow up, um, they're always at Church Safety Guys uh, on Facebook, our web page. And then uh, more recently, we're now on uh, iHeartMedia and also Spotify and Apple uh, Podcasts. So uh, if you miss it one day or you want to catch up on previous episodes, you know, you can go on there and stream it and um, catch kind of catch up with what we're we're doing. Um, and then on the, the left hand side of this, the screen, just to kind of shout out about uh, the books that we have available. We have um, The Road Less Traveled, that's now out and that's available on Amazon. And then War Ready uh, is also out and available. Uh, War Ready is actually, we've had a few people ask us questions about why we have a different cover. So the newer, uh, the newer cover of War Ready is actually the group study edition. So that has a group study component in that. Both, uh, both of those are available on Amazon, um, but the, the, uh, the older copy, the older cover of War Ready is actually just a single person's thing. So if you wanted to get it for your team or something like that, uh, it doesn't have the group study questions or, or the outlines in it. Uh, for a group study thing. So um, as always, thank you for joining us. I will go ahead and close this in prayer and then uh, we will uh, join you next week. So let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for this opportunity that we have uh, to fellowship, to gather together. Lord, I just ask that you would bless the words of uh, Pastor Frank, that uh, people would hear it, that they would be blessed, but that they would also understand uh, that you have your hand on everything and that uh, your way is the best way. And God, I just ask that you would uh, be with us this week, um, be with our churches, those that are listening, that you would bless their churches and just uh, give them a sense of peace with the, the COVID and the protests and everything going on, uh, that uh, churches would be functional and operational again soon. And we just ask this in your name. Amen. 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 Hey, thanks for watching, guys, and you guys have a blessed week. We'll see you next time.